In this lesson, we're going to be looking at the electrolysis for quite practical. And to begin with, we need to just make sure that we are aware of the safety precautions that we need to take for all of these required practicals, as well as the equipment that is being used. So in this case, the only safety precaution is to wear goggles. And here you have a list of all of the equipment that's going to be used in that practical. So the method for this practical is quite simple. We're going to pour some electrolyte into a beaker. We're going to start with sodium chloride solution. We're going to insert some graphite carbon rods, which are going to act as our electrodes which are going to be attached to a low voltage power supply. We're going to turn on that power supply and record our observations at both the electrodes. And then we're going to repeat this for four different electrolytes in total. So here we can see the equipment for the practical. We've got a power supply with two wires going to the positive and to the negative terminals. We have our electrolyte here in the beaker and we have two electrodes here just made of carbon. They're just graphite rods. So what we're going to do is we're going to connect the negative terminal, this black wire, to this electrode here, making this the negative electrode, meaning it's the cathode, this one here, connected to the black wire. And then the red wire is connected to the positive terminal. So I'm going to connect that to the other electrode, making that our positive electrode, meaning it's the anode. So we have our cathode and our anode. And all we're going to do is to place both electrodes into an electrolyte and turn on the power supply and we're going to record our observations at both electrodes and then we're going to replace the electrolyte and see how the observations change depending on the electrolyte that we are using. So the first electrolyte we're going to look at is sodium chloride and you'll notice that all these electrolytes are aqueous. So if we turn on the power supply and look at the observations at each electrode. So at the cathode, we have bubbles of gas being produced. And at the anode, we also have bubbles of gas being produced. So if we look at our electrolyte, we know it's sodium chloride, but importantly, we know it's aqueous, which means it's dissolved in water. So in that electrolyte, I've got sodium ions, Na plus, and chloride ions, Cl minus, but I also have H plus and OH minus, from the water. So at my cathode, I've got two possible products. It could be the Na plus, or it could be the H plus from the water. Now the fact that we've got bubbling, a gas being produced, tells us quite clearly it's hydrogen gas being produced, because if sodium was being produced, it wouldn't be a gas. So we know that our product at the cathode must be the hydrogen gas. Now our options at the anode, we've got the Cl minus, which could form chlorine, or we have the OH minus from the water, which could be forming oxygen. So in order to test for that, I'm going to use some damp litmus paper. And if chlorine is being produced, what will happen is if I hold that litmus paper over that gas being produced, if chlorine is being produced, it will bleach my litmus paper red and then white. And if it is not chlorine and it is in fact oxygen, it will have no effect on the litmus paper. So let's just hold the litmus paper over that gas that's being produced. And what we can see is that the litmus paper has been bleached white. You can see that on the end. So it must in fact be chlorine that's being produced. So I've got hydrogen gas being produced at the cathode. I've got chlorine gas being produced at the anode, which means that the sodium and the hydroxide ions, which are still in the solution, must be forming sodium hydroxide as a third product. So our observations, we should have seen that at our anode, at the positive electrode, we had bubbles of gas being produced. And at the cathode, our negative electrode, we also had bubbles of gas being produced. So in order to identify which element was actually formed at each of our electrodes, we need to consider what ions were in the solution. So we were dealing with sodium chloride solution which means that we have sodium ions and chloride ions from the sodium chloride. But because it's in solution, in aqueous solution, we also have hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions from water. So we have two cations and two anions, but only one cation can go to the cathode, only one anion can go to the anode. So we'll start with the cations. We have sodium 1 plus and hydrogen 1 plus. And in order to determine which one will go to the cathode, we need to look at the reactivity series. So 
Looking at the bottom left, we have a simplified version of the reactivity series, which you have to remember. So we are simply looking at sodium and hydrogen. Which one is the least reactive? The least reactive of your cations will be produced at the cathode. In this case, it's hydrogen because sodium is in group one. So it's right at the top of the reactivity series and hydrogen is near the bottom. Realistically, though, you don't even need to remember all of that simplified reactivity series. You simply need to remember that with aqueous electrolysis, unless you have copper, silver, gold or platinum, your product at the cathode will always be hydrogen because every other metal is more reactive than hydrogen. So when you're dealing with aqueous electrolysis, if your solution contains copper, silver, gold or platinum, then that will be your product at the cathode. If it's any other metal, then the product will always be hydrogen. So the element formed will be hydrogen because the hydrogen ions will go to the cathode and they will be reduced to form hydrogen gas. For the anode, you need to look at your anions. Now we don't need the reactivity series for this. It's much simpler. If you have a group seven element, then that ion will be discharged at the anode. If you don't, then the hydroxide will be discharged instead, and the hydroxide, importantly, will form oxygen gas. So let's look at our two anions. We have chloride and hydroxide. Well, the chlorine is in group seven. It's a halide. So we're going to get chlorine formed at the anode. Anytime you have a group seven element, that is your product at the anode. If you don't have a group seven element, then instead the hydroxide will form oxygen gas. Now, there is going to be a third product here. You look at the two ions you have left in solution. We have sodium one plus, hydroxide one minus. So our third product in this case is going to be sodium hydroxide. So the second electrolyte we have is sodium sulfate. So again, we'll turn on the power supply and look at the electrodes. So looking at the cathode, uh, we have bubbles of gas being produced. And looking at the anode, we also have bubbles of gas being produced. So again, we've got sodium ions and sulfate ions from the sodium sulfate. And because it's aqueous, we also have H plus and OH minus. So it's either the Na plus or the H plus that's going to go to the cathode. Now, again, if the Na plus has gone to the cathode, we would get solid sodium being produced. We've got a gas being produced, so it must be the hydrogen gas that's being produced. And at the anode, we have the choice between sulfur, uh, sulfate sorry, going to the anode or the hydroxide going to the anode. Now, if the sulfate had gone to the anode, we would get sulfur dioxide, which would be an acidic gas, which would turn my litmus paper red. And if my hydroxide goes, it will produce oxygen, which would have no effect on the litmus paper. So if we just hold the litmus paper just there above where that gas is being produced, and we should see that there is no effect. So it must be oxygen that is being produced at that anode. And if we wanted to prove it was oxygen, categorically, we would collect the gas, add a glowing splint, and it would reignite. So from this experiment, our observations were that at the anode, at the positive electrode, we had bubbles of gas. And again, at the negative electrode, at the cathode, we had bubbles of gas being produced. So in order to identify the elements formed, we need to know which ions were present in the electrolyte. So from the sodium sulfate, we have sodium one plus ions and sulfate two minus ions. And from the water, again, we get hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. So looking at the cations, we've got sodium and hydrogen. Quick look at the reactivity series, which one's least reactive? Hydrogen. So it's going to be the hydrogen ion that goes to the cathode to form hydrogen gas. For the anion, we are looking, do we have a group seven element? No, we don't. If you don't have a group seven element, then the hydroxide will go to the anode instead and it will always form oxygen gas. So for our third electrolyte, we have aqueous copper chloride. So again, turn on the power supply and observe 
the observations at the electrode. So we can see that here on the left at the anode, we have a gas being collected. We can see bubbles of gas being produced. And again, here looking at the cathode, this time we can see that there is no change. There are no bubbles being produced. There's no observable change at the moment. We'll have a closer look at that electrode in a minute. So if we look at the possible products, we have copper ions and chloride ions. And because it's aqueous, we also have hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. So at the cathode, the possible products are either the copper ions becoming solid copper or the hydrogen ions from the water becoming hydrogen gas. Now, the fact that there is no gas, no bubbles being produced at the cathode leads me to believe that it's going to be copper that's being produced. But we can have a look at that in a minute to confirm. And at the anode, we have two possible products. Again, it's either the chloride ions forming chlorine gas or the hydroxide ions from the water producing oxygen gas. And again, to confirm that, we're going to use damp blue litmus paper. If chlorine is in fact the product, then our litmus paper will turn red and will then be bleached white. And if oxygen is the product, then there'll be no change to the litmus paper. And if we wanted to prove it was oxygen, we would collect the gas, add a glowing splint, and it would reignite. But at the moment, because we know there's two possible products, chlorine or oxygen, if we can prove it's chlorine, then obviously it's chlorine. And if we can uh, get a negative test for chlorine, then it must be the other one. It must be oxygen. And if we look at our litmus paper, it's very clearly discolored, bleached it white, confirming that we have chlorine being produced at the anode. And if we turn that off and take the electrodes out of the solution to have a look at the cathode, we should see that on the surface of that cathode, we have a coating of copper. If you can see that sort of orangey brown coating on the surface of our cathode, that is the solid copper that has been produced in the reaction. So our observations from this electrolyte, we should have seen that at the positive electrode, the anode, we had bubbles of gas being produced. But at the negative electrode, we had this orange brown coating on the surface of the electrode. And again, to justify which element has been formed, we need to know which ions were in the solution. Well, from the copper chloride, you've got copper ions and chloride ions. And from the water, you've got hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. So we'll start with the cation, use the reactivity series which one is least reactive. The least reactive one in this case is copper. Copper is one of the four metals that is less reactive than hydrogen. So the copper ions are going to be discharged at the cathode, meaning that the element formed at the cathode must have been copper, which explains that orange brown coating. And our product at the anode, well, we've got chloride iron and hydroxide iron, well, chlorine is in group seven, so that will be our product. The chloride ion will be discharged at the anode and become chlorine gas. And finally, we have copper sulfate. So again, we'll turn on the power supply and look at the observations at the electrodes. So what I can see is that at the anode, we have gas being given off, but there is no gas being given off at the cathode. So if we look at the ions we have present, we have copper ions and sulfate ions, but we also have, because it's aqueous, hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. So at the cathode, our options are either the copper ions are going to the cathode and forming solid copper or the hydrogen ions are going to the cathode and forming hydrogen gas. Now, the fact that there are no bubbles at the cathode tells us that it's probably the copper that's being produced. We'll have a look at the electrode in a minute to see if that is the case. And at the anode, we have a gas being collected. Now, again, that gas could either be sulfur dioxide from the sulfate or it could be oxygen from the hydroxide. Now, remember, the sulfur dioxide should be an acidic gas. So if I use damp blue litmus paper, if sulfur dioxide is indeed my product, it will bleach it red or turn it red, I should say. And if there's no change, then we can assume it's oxygen. And if we wanted to prove it was oxygen, we would collect the gas, add a glowing splint and it would reignite. So again, looking at the result from the litmus paper, there's no change. So we can assume that our product at the anode must be oxygen. Now, if we turn this off and take the electrode 
out. We should be able to look at the surface of the cathode. And we should see, if we tilt it up slightly, that sort of orangey brown coating on the surface of the cathode, which is the copper that's being produced. So just there on the surface there, that is solid copper being produced on our cathode. So finally, our last electrolyte, the observation at the anode, again, bubbles of gas being produced, our observation at the cathode is going to be our orange-brown coating. So just like before, we're going to justify the elements being formed by looking at the ions in the solution. From the copper sulfate, we have copper ions and sulfate ions, and from the water, we have hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. Now again, look at the cations, identify the least reactive from the reactivity series, in this case copper, the copper ions will go to the cathode and form copper. Look at the anions, do we have a group 7 element? No, we do not, we have sulfate and hydroxide, so the hydroxide will go to the anode and will form oxygen gas. And here, our third product, our hydrogen and our sulfate left behind, we're going to end up with hydrogen, sulfate or sulfuric acid. So we can see here we've got magnesium chloride dissolved in water, which tells us it's aqueous electrolysis. So our ions, we're going to have a magnesium plus and Cl minus from the magnesium chloride, but also the H plus and the hydroxide from the water. So if we look at the cations first, because they are the products of the cathode, we've got Mg plus or H plus. Look at the reactivity series. Hydrogen is lower than magnesium, so hydrogen is going to be produced at the cathode, meaning that our observation would be bubbles of hydrogen gas being produced. So we're going to see bubbles of gas, and our product at the cathode is going to be hydrogen. The half equation then is going to be going from hydrogen ions to hydrogen gas, so from H plus to H2. So, and we also should know that at the cathode, it's always a reduction reaction. It's always going to be a gain of electrons. So our half equation is going to be 2H plus gaining two electrons because each hydrogen ion needs one electron each, but you need two of them to make H2. So two H plus gaining two electrons to form hydrogen gas. Remember, electrolysis is always ions becoming elements. What would we see at the anode? So our anions we have are chloride, Cl minus from the magnesium chloride, but also hydroxide from the water. And we should remember that if it's a group seven element, that is always produced at the anode. So our product of the anode will be chlorine, which we should know is a gas. So again, we're going to see bubbles of gas being produced. If you wanted to prove it was chlorine, you could use damp blue litmus paper and it would turn red and then bleach white. If you wanted to prove it was hydrogen at the cathode, you would collect the gas, uh, ignite it with a lit splint and it will burn with a squeaky pop. And finally, the half equation for the reaction of the anode, we know we're going from ions to elements. So we're going from chloride ions to chlorine gas. So from Cl minus to Cl2. And it's at the anode, and the anode is always oxidation, which is loss of electrons. So it's going to be 2Cl minus going to Cl2, having lost two electrons, because each chloride ion needs to lose one electron. But of course, you need two of them to make chlorine Cl2. So those are your six answers.